and gentlemen, and welcome to the Chesapeake Biological Labs Science for the Community seminar series this evening. For those of you who've attended before, you may notice a slightly different background behind me today. Uh, I have the embarrassing uh, announcement to make that I locked myself out of the room that I usually do this in. And so this is very much a, 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 a temporary sit, sit situation. I'm told the day will end soon. Um, so welcome to the Science for Community uh, lecture series. This is the third in this autumn series where we have tried to bring uh, members of our community, members of our research community, uh, to give presentations to the community about the diverse impacts of climate change on the natural and human si system. We started out with a Climate 101 from Dr. Holly Kilborn. And last week, for those of you who joined us, Dr. Mark Cochran from our Appalachian Lab in the western part of the state gave a wonderful presentation about how wildfires are changing across the globe and with a particular focus on North America. In the weeks that follow, we'll hear about climate change in the Arctic. We'll hear about how climate um, change reports are put together, in particular the international, the intergovernmental panel on climate change reports, the IPCC. Uh, and then we will finish up with trying to synthesize that information about how uh, insurance companies and other organizations make decisions in the face of climate change risks. Tonight, um, we're going to put a toe in the aquatic realm. And tonight we have Dr. Jenny Neslidge talking about climate impacts on one of my favorite fish, the golden tile fish, as you can see from the photo, it's, it's a beautiful fish. And Jenny will tell you some of its unusual behaviors in her presentation, I'm sure. Um, Jenny is well qualified to give this presentation. In addition to uh, a strong academic background, including degrees from Cornell, uh, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and a PhD from Michigan State. She also worked for the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission as a senior stock assessment scientist for approximately seven years before she joined our faculty in 2015. Um, during her time here, she has in fact helped conduct the assessment for this species in the South Atlantic. Um, Jenny also serves as chair of the South Atlantic Scientific and Statistical Committee uh, and on various other scientific bodies. Her research involves not only golden tilefish, but striped bass and Atlantic menhaden. Um, so tonight she's going to be talking about climate impacts on golden tilefish past and present. This is a Zoom conference rather than a Zoom meeting. And so you will not be able to ask questions during the presentation or unfortunately unmute and ask questions at the end. We do, however, encourage you to ask questions during, uh, sorry, at the end of the presentation in the chat box. And my colleague, Sarah Brzezinski, our outreach coordinator will moderate those questions to ensure as many people uh, get to ask their questions as possible. If you've missed any of our previous Science for the Community lectures or know that you'll miss any of them in the future. All of these lectures are recorded and hosted online, thanks to the generous support of our sponsors, PNC Bank and Southern Maryland Toyota. So with that, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jenny Neslich. Jenny, over to you. Thank you very much, Tom, for that uh, kind introduction. And thank you all for being here tonight virtually. I appreciate this. Um, I, as, as, fishery, as uh, Tom mentioned, I am a fishery scientist and my research focuses primarily on what's called stock assessment, which is the process of using statistical models to estimate essentially how many fish are in the sea and how many fish we can sustainably catch. But there's been growing awareness among scientists in the field uh, of the importance of climate 
and its impact on fish population trends. So in recent years, I've been focusing more closely on trying to understand how climate and environmental conditions in general uh, impact fish and how that might impact our nation's fisheries. So I've worked a lot, as Tom mentioned, on a, um, several different species, thing, everything from American lobster to eel to menhaden and striped bass. But the research I'm gonna focus on today is the species known as golden tilefish. Now this is a species that not everyone's familiar with. Uh, you uh, aren't too likely to see it at your local seafood counter, uh, partly because there's a relatively small commercial fishery for them. And also the meat doesn't hold up very well to freezing, so you don't see it distributed widely. It primarily shows up in seafood markets in kind of the New Jersey, New York area, and then farther south near Flor in the Florida area. Um, there are a small group of dedicated anglers who enjoy recreationally fishing for them as well. But fishery scientists love this fish because it poses a great mystery. So while I promise you I'll get to the science eventually, uh, I'm gonna begin this talk with a bit of history. So compared to many other fish on the East Coast, relatively little is known about golden tilefish, in part because surprisingly, they're relatively new on the fishery science scene. Uh, they were first caught in 1879, which is relatively late for identifying a new species. Uh, they found them off the southern coast of Nantucket in southern New England. Uh, the first few specimens that were collected were sent down here to Washington DC area uh, to the Smithsonian for identification. Uh, and it caught the attention of a scientist named Spencer Fullerton Baird. Uh, now, Spencer Baird was the former secretary of the Smithsonian, uh, and he was later appointed by President Ulysses S. Grant as the first commissioner of the U.S. Fish Commission, which is the precursor to today's NOAA's, uh, NOAA Fisheries Service, which manages federal fisheries in the U.S. So Baird was a naturalist by training. He collected a lot of different animals for the Smithsonian. And he made finding tilefish for study and research one of the main goals of many of the early research surveys uh, that were conducted for fish um, out of the Woods Hole Lab up in Cape Cod. But here's the fun part. Just when we thought we were getting to know golden tilefish, uh, this new species, something really big and terrible happened. Only just three years after their initial discovery, uh, shipping vessels and fishing vessels came into port in Southern New England reporting this huge die-off event in 1882. So these, these folks were reporting seeing dead adult tilefish with no apparent trauma or lesions, didn't seem to be sick or injured in any way, floating belly up on the surface of the ocean over an area spanning 175, 175 miles long and 25 miles wide. It was a huge die-off event. And many uh, fishermen and scientists thought that tilefish had gone extinct. No one caught them for many years. So after that die-off event in 1882, uh, Spencer Baird sent out research vessels searching for them annually. He was kind of obsessed with this. Um, they just found this, discovered this new species and they went extinct is what he thought. Um, but for many years, they, they searched for them without any success. Uh, in 1892, they set some trawls specifically trying to catch tilefish, but they brought up only eight little fish. Uh, it wasn't until the late 1890s, 1898, that the first fishermen started catching them again. Um, the good news is that the population eventually rebounded. But this famous 1882 die-off event uh, has fascinated fisheries scientists from the 1800s to today. The question is, of course, what happened, right? We've been trying to answer this question ever since. Uh, and I'm guessing that given the title of my talk, you're already onto the answer. You probably guessed that climate might be uh, the prime suspect. And I'll describe that in the talk. But to understand uh, the hypotheses and the research that has been done to attempt to solve this mystery, uh, as well as to understand my more recent research, uh, we need to know, to know a little bit more about the biology of the animal and how it reacts to conditions in its environment. So I'll start by giving you a uh, tilefish primer, if you will, a tilefish 101, and describe their very unique biology. And then I'm gonna describe for you what 
we think we know about trends uh, in the population of the species and why we suspect climate may be highly influential. And then um, I'll share with you my recent research on the potential linkages between climate cycles and typhus population dynamics. And then I'll conclude uh, with a description of how future changes in climate might impact uh, tile fish fishery, their management, uh, and the serious challenges that that uh, presents us. So without further ado, let's talk about the biology of golden tilefish. So they are, as Tom mentioned, an absolutely gorgeous fish, uh, but they're found uh, at the bottom of the ocean. They're bottom dwelling uh, and they range uh, from the uh, northeastern region off the Maritimes, off Nova Scotia and Canada, and they go as far south as Florida on the east coast, but then they also range into the Gulf of Mexico and can be found as far south as Suriname in uh, South, south America. They feed primarily on shrimp and crabs and crustaceans and uh, brittle stars. I don't know if you've ever been to the shore. They're kind of like those really skinny starfish that you might find. But honestly, they will eat anything they can come across. They have, we found in their stomachs, fish, squid, clams, you name it. If they can get it, they will, they will eat it. Uh, but tile fish are cool because they are a very long lived species. They um, mature very early though. So they can live, well, they typically live into their twenties, uh, but they can live as old as 40 or so, but they mature very early around age six. Uh, so that's usually typically your, your longer lived fish will mature later in life, but these guys mature very early. Uh, they can also grow to be quite large. They uh, reach lengths of up to 40 inches uh, and can be quite heavy. Now, what makes them really unusual and fascinating though, is that they are highly stenothermic. And that's a term that means they can only tolerate a very narrow range of water temperatures, about uh, 48 to 57 degrees cell, uh, Fahrenheit. So along the east coast of the United States, that really limits them to a very thin band of habitat along the outer continental shelf slope, which you can see I've, I've highlighted here in red. So that limits them then to these depths of about 250 to 1,000 feet deep. We don't think they migrate, we've tagged them. They seem to pretty much stay put once they become adults, they stay in one place. And what makes them even stranger is that they have this really odd behavior where they create these burrows in the sand or the mud along the sea floor, and then they go in them head first, but they aren't quite big enough that they can get all the way in necessarily or turn around in them. We don't really know what they're doing in these burrows on the ocean floor, but uh, we've sent remote vehicles down to, uh, to, to check these out and get these great photos and also sonar maps of the ocean floor. And it's just dotted with these tilefish burrows, but no one really knows what they're doing in there. So if you wanna be a tilefish biologist when you grow up, this is the, this is the question you can, you can help us all answer. But uh, that's a fun fact. But when it comes to uh, their fisheries on the East Coast, this is uh, federally managed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration or NOAA. Their fish fisheries service divides this population into two stocks or, or subpopulations, if you will. Uh, and that line happens to be, that dividing line happens to be at the Virginia, North Carolina border. Now, you can probably imagine that that's not a biological border, right? That's dividing the Northern and Southern stocks. Tilefish don't know when they've crossed the Virginia state line. Uh, this is probably not biologically defensible. Um, if there is a difference between these two, the Northern and the Southern stocks, it's probably occurring a little farther South off of Cape Hatteras, which is um, a more natural ecological break based on ocean currents and other ecosystem components. So, um, but that's the way it is. Uh, and it's um, regardless that the two stocks are treated as distinctly different and they have separate management plans and regulations that are established by two separate fishery management councils. Now to, to get an idea of what their trends look like over time, uh, we actually are kind of limited. They're 
uh, they're not as popular as other species, so they don't receive as much funding to do research. And also they're found at quite deep depths. And so it's really hard to target them in research surveys. Uh, some of the traditional gears that we use to try and catch them for research uh, don't necessarily work on, on that shelf slope area. Uh, so a lot of the information that we have to study them are commercial landings data or harvest data. Going, um, but the good news is that it actually goes back as early as the, 19, the early 1900s. So what I'm showing you here in this graph uh, is a time series of historical landings or harvest of tilefish broken out by the northern versus the southern stocks. So the black line with the circles represents northern landings and the gray line with the squares represents the southern landings. Now, one of the things you'll notice right away is that the directed fishery for tile fish in the south is much newer. Uh, we didn't really see the longline fishery there kick in until the 70s. Uh, the other thing that you may notice right away is that there appear to be these cycles, these up and down boom and busts over time. Uh, and the, um, there, some of these boom uh, and bust years are kind of predictable. For instance, uh, during the two world wars, World War II in particular, World War I as well, we expect, and, and it's not too surprising, that landings were low in those years. Uh, folks uh, who were fishermen, many of them were serving overseas and weren't fishing. Uh, and those who were here uh, did not really want to have their boats sunk by a U-boat. And so they, um, the fishing was, was greatly curtailed. But even that, setting that aside, there's still a cyclicity here. There's a periodicity to the landings trends. Uh, and that has really grabbed the attention of scientists. And it's a potential indicator that golden tilefish might be responding in some way to cycles in their environment with high recruitment of young fish to the population and the fishery in good favorable years potentially. And dips in the landings uh, uh, and the fishery catches in unfavorable years. Uh, there's one other thing I want to point out. You may have noticed this big spike in 1916. And initially, when people look at this, they think that might be a mistake uh, in the data. But actually, we don't think it is. So after that 1882 die off, the population slowly recovered and by the turn of the century in the early 1900s, they were back to, to decent levels again, as best we can tell. Uh, and at that point, the US government began a campaign, a very intense campaign to get people to go fish for and eat this new species that they were largely unfamiliar with that was showing up in the seafood markets. So this is a picture of a poster from 1915 advertising this new fish as food. Uh, and honestly, if you eat seafood and you've never tried to tile fish and you have a chance to, you really should. It is um, a very soft, white, flaky, buttery, delicious fish. Um, highly recommend it. So, uh, but this indicates to us based on the history uh, of, the, uh, of what the, the, this campaign that the government ran, that there was actually a big boom in the harvest around 1916, 1915. Uh, which was followed by a bust set of years in uh, fishery catches, probably due to overfishing. They likely um, overcapitalized, uh, but the population uh, recovered. So certainly some of the cycles that I showed you in the last slide in harvest may be due to overfishing, but we don't think they all were. And why do we think that? Well, uh, from the stock assessment models that I've run for the Southern stock and for those that have been run by my NOAA colleagues for the Northern stock, there appears to be um, a periodicity in the pattern of recruitment of young juvenile fish to the fishery. In other words, when they get big enough to be caught by the long lines. So uh, you can see it here. These are again, the estimates of um, Recruitment for the north are indicated by this black line with the black circles and the south with the gray line with the gray squares. So these are model estimates of juvenile fish entering the fishery uh, over this, this, time, this time span. And again, you can see there's this periodicity, ups and downs uh, in recruitment of young fish. So, 
even though there have been changes in the management of these fish stocks, we, they didn't occur at, at this regular frequency of five to seven years. Uh, so we think that the animal might be responding in some way to something in its environment that's periodic. The question then becomes though, what aspect of their environment? And is this linked in some way to their sensitivity to water temperature and possibly the mass die-off event of 1882? And that's the mystery. So to understand the relationship between golden tilefish and an envi its environment, uh, we really have to start with the early science that tried to identify and speculate on the uh, causes of that 1882 die-off. That's where the initial tilefish research on population dynamics began. So I'll start by discussing the historical die-off event and uh, speculation about what caused it. And then I'll launch into a description of my more recent research. So the 1882 die-off, there were, two main culprits identified by scientists um, that might have caused that die-off event. And they may have been working in tandem. They may not be independent. The first uh, was an anomalous low in a natural climate cycle called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which I'll de describe in more detail shortly. The second potential culprit was an anomalous southward shift of an ocean current called the Labrador Current. So let's go through each of these and I'll describe them in a bit more detail. Uh, now, climate cycles uh, are, are really the result of interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. And they create these period, periodic patterns that can run on the order of years to decades. And you are probably most familiar with one called El Nino. Your weathermen get really excited when it's an El Nino year. So that's another interaction between ocean temperatures and atmospheric patterns with a periodicity of about three to seven years. And it tends to cause different weather conditions in different parts of the world, depending on where you are. Now the natural climate pattern that was suggested to have contributed to the tilefish die off is, um, called the North Atlantic Oscillation, now that, or the NAO for short. So the NAO is basically a term that refers to variation in sea surface pressure in the North Atlantic. So when there's a dip in this NAO, it tends to lead to high pressure near the Azores off of Portugal. So in this map would be right around here. Um, and then it leads to low pressure over Iceland. And that tends to create these strong westerly winds and more intense storms. And then what's important at golden tilefish, cooler sea surface temperatures within this kind of uh, east coast Gulf of Mexico range. So the early scientists noted that there had been a very low dip in the index that tracks the NAO in the winter preceding the 1882 tilefish die off. So here you can see this 1881 anomaly in the NAO, it was very low. Um, the, uh, they also noticed though, when they plotted this out, that it wasn't the lowest on record. The lowest on record was in 2010, but there was no mass die off of tilefish that occurred in that year. So that kind of indicated to us that the story's probably way more complicated than that. In other words, we can't just blame the NAO and declare the mystery solved. What else might be going on? Well, scientists then noted also that in 1882, there was uh, recorded in a couple of the bottom temperature uh, uh, monitoring stations at the bottom of the ocean in Southern New England. They noted that there was this strong and somewhat rare southward movement of an Arctic Ocean current called the Labrador Current. So there are a large number of named ocean currents all over the world, and they do a lot of important things and fish are impacted by them very strongly. But this one in particular, which I'm showing you with the little red arrow here, the Labrador Current, this one brings cold Arctic Ocean waters down from the Labrador Sea between Canada and Greenland, down along the east coast of Canada through the Maritimes, and into the Northeastern United States. It tends to kind of hug the coast and bring cold water southward. 
while that famous Gulf Stream that most folks are familiar with brings warmer waters northward and kind of offshore. So here's another picture giving you an idea of what this looks like. So note that the Labrador current is bringing cold water southward uh, along the in more inshore regions as the Gulf Stream's bringing warmer water northward and, and kind of offshore. Now, the trick is that the exact place where these two meet um, and the northernmost extent of the Gulf Stream, the southernmost extent of the Labrador current, uh, that changes from month to month and year to year. And that generates different weather patterns and different ocean temperature conditions, which impact fish and fish trends. And in particular, very likely golden tilefish. Turns out that in 1882, the Labrador current, which is indicated here with these black arrows, uh, ended up dumping a very large amount of coal water right into the golden tilefish habitat in the mid-Atlantic indicated by this black box. So scientists think that an anomalously low NAO climate cycle in combination with this high southward flow of the Labrador current, cold water, is thought to have brought enough of a rush of cold water suddenly into the, the uh, tilefish habitat. And given they don't move very much, they weren't able to rush away, move, migrate, or adapt very quickly. And because they're so steamothermic, very highly intolerant of cold temperatures, they may have died of exposure. Now, without a time machine, we'll never know for sure whether this is the explanation, but this is our best guess at the moment as to what caused that mass die off. This work um, is historical, but it was a springboard to my research in which I've been trying to understand better what is behind the cycles that we see in recent trends in tilefish catches and how that might affect their future given climate change and the management of their fisheries, which I will talk about next. So I'd like to uh, describe for you a research project that was uh, a collaborative effort between myself Dr. Slava Lubchic here at Chesapeake Biological Lab, which I will stop and plug his talk in this series will be November 2nd. He's brilliant and funny and wonderful and you should definitely tune in for his talk as well. But Slava and I worked with uh, a couple of NOAA scientists from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center uh, and Rutgers University. We all got together and worked on a project that was funded by NOAA through their Fisheries and the Environment Program, which was aimed at exploring environmental drivers or causes of uh, dynamics, fish dynamics. In particular, our project was of course, golden tilefish. Now the, the gory details are in our recent paper, which was just published in Fisheries Oceanography. And at the end of the talk, I'll give you my email. If you're interested in reading it, I can just ping me, I can send you a copy. But what I'm gonna do in the next few slides is give you kind of a mile high view, uh, overview of the, um, the key methods and results and, and what they mean uh, for tilefish uh, and their future. So the goal of this research was to explore the relationship between long-term trends in tilefish landings and a suite of climate indices and environmental variables, including but not limited to the NAO and the Labrador current, which as I just mentioned, had been identified as potential cause of the 1882 die-off. But um, while landings are important to understand in and of themselves, we know that fishery landings aren't just affected by environmental conditions. They're also affected by how much effort the fishermen put into fishing, right? So we were interested in accounting for effort as well. So in theory, the more you fish, the more you catch, unless the population is really low, right? So what we do is we track the total amount harvested and the amount of effort that was expended to harvest those fish. So you can imagine that if you go out and you spend 24 hours fishing and you catch 100 fish, that's great. If you go out a month later and you spend the same 24 hour period fishing, but you only catch 50 fish, and then the next month you go out, spend 24 hours, and you only catch five fish, over time, your catch per unit effort has declined, and that's an indication 
that the population may be declining as well. So for time periods, more recent years, where we have effort data and they were available, we also explored the relationship between catch per unit effort, which we call CPUE, and environmental factors. And that hadn't previously been done. So what little is known about golden tilefish uh, and the drivers of their, of their dynamics, um, it, it, there's not much known about it. There's just that little bit that I really, that I shared with you uh, about that re with regards to the, the die off. So when we tackled this problem, we tried to take a broad exploratory, uh, comprehensive kitchen soup approach to trying to track down what potential environmental factors might be highly influential on uh, fishery catches. So we actually ran three different analyses. The first focused just on the landings time series, which is the longest that we have. It goes back to 1915 and all the way through to the late two, uh, two, around 2017, I think was our last year. So for this landings analysis, we um, had to focus on data that was long-term in nature. So we included the North Atlantic Oscillation uh, because of its association with a die-off, but we also had some available to us some long-term indices of sea surface temperature. Uh, we also included factors that accounted for management changes in regulations, as well as more natural changes that occurred in the fishery over time. Uh, but we also included another factor, and that is um, a climate factor called the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation, or AMO. And this is another measure of climate variability in the North Atlantic Ocean. And it essentially represents changes or cycles in sea surface temperature. We added the AMO uh, because the population dynamics of a large number of other fish on the East Coast have recently been linked to the AMO and it hadn't been considered before for golden tilefish. Given they are so sensitive to water temperatures, we thought the AMO might be something we should throw in the mix. So that was the landings analysis. Um, when it came to analyzing the catch per unit effort data though, that's much shorter time series, right? Uh, NOAA just started collecting effort data for the northern and southern stocks in the mid 90s. Uh, but the, the trade off of doing this analysis, the good part, is that we have a plethora of environmental data available to us in the more recent years. So we were able to explore the influence of not just the NAO and the AMO climate indices, but also very detailed information on oceanic currents. So the Labrador current for the northern stock. Uh, the Florida current for the southern stock, which is essentially the lower southern end of the Gulf Stream off the Florida, Georgia, Carolinas area. Um, we also looked at position and flow of the Gulf Stream along the northeast uh, portion of the US for the northern stock. Then we also had available to us in more recent years, very detailed ocean monitoring data, including uh, bottom and sea surface temperatures, sea surface pressure, uh, wind velocity and direction, I guess, temp speed and direction, uh, as well as the, the geographic coordinates of those ocean uh, condition data. And then finally, we also included information on management changes that occurred over time that may have impacted fishery effort and the resulting catch. Then finally, for all of the models, uh, we explored what we call time lags in these effects. So the let's say the impact of the Labrador current on the fishery or the population might be immediate in the same year in which it was observed, or we might see a delay in that impact until a few years later, depending on the nature of how it interacts with the fish. And so we included time lags for many of those variables. Now, the I'm just going to very briefly go over the methods. Basically, we took a two-step approach to modeling and trying to quantify the relationship between either landings or catch per unit effort and these environmental variables. So first we used a machine learning technique called random forest regression. And that essentially allowed us to narrow down this huge list of potential variables into a small set of likely candidates. Then we went and built a predictive set of statistical models called GAMS uh, or generalized additive mixed models 
those allowed us to take that pared down list of potential variables and more in a more detailed way characterize the exact relationship between landings or catch pre-unit effort and the most closely associated environmental variables. So what did we find? Let's start with the first model, the landings model for the Northern stock. Remember, this is the long time series going back to 1915. So here, um, what we found was that the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation uh, was closely associated with landings for the Northern stock with the time lag of about seven years. Uh, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation, was also associated with landings at time lags of about three to four years. Uh, and, um, but the interesting thing is that the AMO was the most influential as opposed to the NAO, which is what had been indicated in previous studies. Uh, in essence, it explained, uh, the AMO ended up explaining um, more than half of the variability in the data. When we look at catch per unit effort and take fishing effort into account, um, and this is looking from the 1990s onward, we have much more detailed fishery and environmental data available. And what we found again was that the AMO with a time lag of about six to seven years uh, was most influential. Uh, but also the Gulf Stream position, how far that warm water reached northward what, uh, was also associated with catch per unit effort, um, but all, and as well as the Labrador current flow. So the, um, the amount of, of cold water that's coming down from the Arctic was also uh, related to catch per unit effort in the north. So this kind of validates some of the earlier work that had been done indicating that maybe that old die off um, did, did actually um, have the the it was influenced by the Labrador current um, and climate cycles. But again, in this model, the AMO was most influential and it explained over 60% of variability in the data. And then finally, if we move south uh, and look at the analysis of catch per unit effort from North Carolina to Florida, what we found was that once again, the AMO with a time lag of two to seven years uh, was most influential as well as management regulations, in particular a quota that was put in place uh, in recent years, uh, as well as the Florida current, which is bringing warm water northward, uh, and sea surface temperatures and the latitude. So that's probably not too surprising given you can see the, the span of latitude from North Carolina to Florida is quite extensive in the Southern stock unit. Whereas in the North, there's certainly latitudinal variation, but there's also this uh, east-west spread as well. So in the south, where you are uh, between North Carolina and Florida really impacted um, the environmental conditions and the catch per unit effort. But again, the AMO explained more than 60% of variability in the data. Now, what does all this mean? And what, why, why should I care, right? Um, so what are the implications of this study? What we found in essence was that the AMO was most closely associated with landings and catch per unit effort in all three models, both the short and the long term, as well as the northern and southern uh, stock units. So, although the AMO is, is essentially an index of sea surface temperature conditions, it's not a real phenomenon in and of itself. It does kind of confirm that this, that the golden tilefish is highly sensitive to water temperatures. Uh, but if you've been listening closely, you might be asking yourself, why, if tilefish are hanging out on the seafloor, are they so sensitive to sea surface temperatures, right? They can be very different, especially at the depths at which, which you find golden tilefish. So the key to understanding these results, I think, lies in the time lags that we identified, uh, the, the time in which it takes for these impacts to be seen in the fishery. So the AMO factor was influential in our models, mostly at time lags of about six to seven years. That indicates to us that sea surface temperatures when they, let's say, peak or when they drop really low, that impacts the population. Um, and we don't really see it though, we don't feel it in the fishery until six to seven years later. And that leads us to think the impact is not so much on the adults per se, like we saw with the die-off event, but more on the larvae than the juvenile animals. 
So for example, if the temperature gets too cold and it negatively impacts larval survival, uh, that, that information won't actually show up in the fishery when, uh, as lower catches until six to seven years later when that cohort of fish grows big enough to enter the fishery. So, oops, my slide is not advancing. There we go. So the, um, the population effects aren't felt uh, the impact of the climate on the, the juvenile fish isn't felt and noticed until they would have entered the fishery a few years later. Now, we're not sure what the exact mechanism is here, but we do know from studies of other fish that water temperature can impact the survival of larvae and juvenile fish by impacting their metabolism, it could be a cold shock, but most likely uh, the AMO is probably affecting food availability, the plankton that they eat. Um, or it could also be impacting the, the, um, the currents that are allowing them to disperse appropriately to their nursery habitats. So um, how might this be affecting fisheries management? And what are the, what are the implications for the future? Well, First, it's important to recognize that successful fisheries rely on successful recruitment of juvenile fish. And that may rely not just on how many adult spawners there are in the water, but on the environmental conditions being just right for those juvenile fish. Now, the Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Council manages the northern stock of golden tilefish, and they already recognize that their fishery relies on these five to seven year spikes in recruitment to sustain the fishery. But as we start to see climate changing, we might see golden tilefish populations reacting in a different way. Um, and perhaps that periodicity may lengthen or, or shorten. We'll see what happens. Um, but what do we expect in general with global climate change? Um, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, the first thing that I thought you might be interested in knowing is that Golden tilefish are now being caught in some of the fishery uh, research cruises that are going on in the Gulf of Maine. Now, this is surprising to scientists um, given that they aren't typically found in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and so this may indicate that they're starting to move into uh, areas that they previously did, wouldn't have inhabited and that the bottom habitat is changing and the conditions are changing. But an even more obvious and potentially uh, informative thing that's going on is, is the reaction of the golden tilefish's sister species, the blue line tilefish, to, uh, to recent environmental conditions. So this, this is a blue line tilefish, looks a lot like a golden tilefish, except it's got these beautiful blue lines by its eye. Um, so these blue lines are typically caught um, in, in larger numbers in the southeast and only a bit more in the north. Uh, and there's, uh, in recent years, they've been caught, uh, the more of them have been caught in the northern region than we typically see. And so there's been quite a lot of consternation in federal fisheries management because uh, the southern stock is managed by one council and the northern stock is managed by another. And they don't always see the eye to eye, especially when there might be some sharing of, of quota uh, with each other. And so this is one of the challenges that we're gonna be facing a lot in the near future, I believe in fisheries management. But this question of how climate might impact our nation's fisheries is a serious concern and a top priority for fisheries management agencies. Uh, NOAA conducted a climate vulnerability assessment for the Northeast recently, and this is a summary of their results. So along the horizontal axis, we have kind of the degree of which we expect their habitat to be impacted. And along the vertical axis, we see kind of how their life history might be sensitive, maybe their physiology or their migration or their behavior, how sensitive that might be to climate change. You can see our golden tilefish show up in the high impact, potential impact of climate sections. So this is something that we're definitely um, going to keep an eye on, but given my talk, you're probably not too surprised. Now the Southeast Climate Vulnerabil Vulnerability Assessment is hot off the press. It's just coming out, um, I believe this week officially. Uh, you can see in the South as well, it's been identified as high or very high highly vulnerable to uh, climate. 
And this is something that uh, concerns me. I've done the assessment for this dock in the South in the past, and I work very closely with the scientists and fishermen who rely on this dock. So this is something that we're gonna definitely keep an eye on. Uh, just in general, I wanted to point out though, from using this wonderful graph from the Northeast analysis of climate vulnerability, that uh, some, in general, we think that some fish species will benefit from climate change, some will experience negative impacts and some it might balance out or they might not be impacted at all. In the Northeast though, their assessment is that more species will be negatively impacted by climate than will be positively or, new, or neutrally impacted. And so that's something that um, is, makes, keeps managers on high alert. Uh, the fishery management system though, that monitors the stocks and controls the regulations is not as nimble as the science, and it may struggle to react in time to address some of these issues that may pop up for highly vulnerable species and the fisheries and the fishermen that rely upon them. So that's something uh, that we need to, to keep in mind. So we don't know what the future will hold for golden tilefish. We anticipate though that changing climate will likely mean changes in water temperature and ocean currents, and that could heavily impact the species and its relatives. But uh, this is a small and highly valuable fishery, uh, and it's just a darn cool animal that I absolutely love. So we'll be keeping a very close eye on tilefish in the years to come. And I know that uh, we're in a virtual situation here, but if you have any questions, hopefully you can put them in the chat. And if you don't get your question answered here, or if you think of something later on, feel free to email me, reach out. Um, I'd be happy to discuss tilefish with you. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, Sarah. Jenny, thank you so much for a great talk. That was, was wonderful. Um, and we've already had, had question art pouring in. Um, so our first question is hydratory are tilefish, meaning are they tied, tied, tied to a specific location or do they follow all of their food source? You asked how migratory are they? Yes. Yeah, they are not migratory at all. So um, we believe that the, the larvae probably move with currents um, and maybe the juveniles, tend, they tend to be found in shallower waters. Uh, but once the adults settle and start setting up territories in those burrows, those strange burrows, um, they tend to be very centered. They do not our understanding, the best of our understanding, is that they are not migratory. And that's, of course, one of the problems. They probably will not be able to move very quickly as, as things change. All right, and another question that we have coming through. Um, it's interesting to think that we were measuring temperatures in the mid-Atlantic when we didn't even even cars yet back in the 1880s. Um, who, who was do measuring and how were they doing it? Again? The temperatures you said mm -hmm. in the 1880s? Sorry, it's breaking up a little. Um, so the temperature data that we used for that longer time series analysis goes back to the early 1900s. And a lot of that, um, there were a few bottom temperature monitoring sites. Uh, the US uh, Bureau of Fisheries had a few. There were some um, academic groups that had just a couple sensors very rough uh, data uh, along the East Coast. And then over time, it's been building. And now we have a whole fleet of remotely operated or independent robots, basically diving through the ocean all over the, the Atlantic, collecting information at various depths. So it's kind of exponential, the amount of, of temperature data that we have. We don't have um, too much really though, prior to maybe the, I'd say, it really starts to take off in the 80s and 90s. So it's really just a couple of, of locations back in the 1800s and the early 1900s. And then it's, it's blossomed since then. That's great. Um, one of the other questions that we have came, came through from Jack Templeton. And Mr. Temple, Templeton asks, can, can tailfish be tagged? Um, is there any tagging or efforts that have been implemented and can they survive being, being brought surface and then, then released in light of the temperature? Excellent question. Yeah, they uh, are being brought up as 
as this gentleman has has, suggest, has pointed out from very deep depths. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, when fish are brought up from those really high pressure deep areas, and they're brought to the surface when you're fishing and reeling them in, um, they tend to experience what's called barrel trauma. And it's really kind of gross. Sometimes their eyes pop out or their stomach comes out of their mouth, all kinds of disgusting things happen. Um, and it's not, sometimes they can recover from that. Uh, and there are methods that can be done, that can be used to try and help them do that. Um, and if they return to the water very quickly, they often can recover. Um, but tilefish uh, are pretty rough. Um, we have, there has been some tagging of them, but in general, um, it's not super successful, as well as it's hard to monitor them then at those depths. Um, so tagging hasn't been something that we've done a lot of. Uh, for, for golden tile fish or blue lines or any of the tile fish. Um, and it's also because they're typically um, best targeted using long lines, it's also, um, you know, there's the, they might have hook issues and whatnot. So yeah, it's really challenging to get information on them using tagging. And other questions that come through. How is, is the 40 lifespan determined? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Of course. Um, how is the 40 year lifespan deter determined? How determine how long fish are living? Ah, sorry, yeah, it was breaking up again a little. So um, we largely determine the age in fish by looking at their ear bone. So their ear bone is, um, it has calcifies and the, it gets rings on it like a tree. And you can read it if you're trained right and you know enough about the species um, so that in the years where it's in, in, in times in, the, within, excuse me, within the year when it's cold, it's not growing as much. And during the warmer seasons, the, it grows faster and you get these wider bands between the rings in their ear bone like a tree. Um, and so that's one of the ways that we're able to identify how old a fish is. It's still, you know, it's, it's, as they get to be really old, it can be really tricky, but knowing that they're somewhere in the thirties and forties is, is, is pretty impressive for some of these fish, but yeah, that's how we tell. So just like, like rings on a tree when, when you tree down, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, um, so the next question that we have, um, how do we go, go about reconciling differences between managers of tilefish in the northern and the sub southern regions? Wonderful question. Um, well, so far, uh, when it, at least what I can tell you what's been done with blue line tilefish, um, when we realized that this was going on and there was initial panic, but then uh, folks realized that maybe we should get the um, scientific committees that advise the managers together um, to review the assessment and its results and to try and figure out um, using some of the recent fisheries, uh, there were some research, research surveys that were done targeting tilefish, what the, the a reasonable biologically based breakdown of the Northern versus Southern quota should look like. Um, so that committee was a, made up of folks from the Northern Advisory Committee and the Southern Advisory Committee got together and they hashed it out and tried to figure out to the best of our scientific knowledge, how, how, what might be a reasonable way to figure that out. Um, I will say that this is a growing challenge, particularly on the East Coast, because we do have these two, uh, we actually have three man fishery management councils on the East Coast. There's the South Atlantic, the mid-Atlantic, and then there's a New England. Um, and as fish start to potentially expand their range, we're gonna have more and more of these challenges. And so uh, the scientists that advise these fishery management councils, we tend to get together once a year. One of the main topics on the agenda for this year's meeting is how do we deal with these issues? We're starting to see bleed over of various fish uh, moving north or south uh, and we're not prepared to deal with that. They were set up, these councils were set up by Congress as distinctly different units independent. 
they shouldn't have to bargain with each other or deal with each other in that way. And so this is brand new territory. And like I said, I think it's gonna be a major, major challenge and maybe slow going. Yeah. It's good that it's on, on the agenda. That's a good step in the right direction. Um, jumping back to the few fish that have been tagged, um, was, was anything concluded from that data? Did tilefish stay in the same burrows, for example, or were, were they found again? Ooh, you know, I'm not as familiar with the details of that as I probably should be. So I'm not sure I should talk out of turn. I do know that from some of the video analysis they've done, they, that they do tend to defend territories right around um, uh, specific burrows. Um, now, I don't think we know as much about the females. Um, that's particularly the males will do that. Um, and they there's also concern based on some early studies that the males may be more aggressive in taking hooks and going after the baited hooks on the long lines. And so we may see um, more males or uh, more aggressive males in our fishery surveys and our studies than uh, females or the larger spawning females. So the data may be biased um, because of that, but I'm, I'm not gonna speculate too much because I don't remember the details of that, but they are very territorial within their little range and the males do set up these territories that they highly defend yeah that's pretty cool um so our next question is is it possible that the level of fishing effort has cha changed from 1880s for example with sailing vessels versus power boats in the 1940s 40s and 50s absolutely so um when, uh, I'll say with our analysis, uh, two things. The first is that with that long-term analysis, we weren't accounting for fishery effort because we don't have effort information prior to the 1990s really. Um, but we did account for some of those changes that you're talking about with that management time block that I mentioned. And so essentially what we were able to do is create kind of dummy time periods where we know there were major changes. So. In the 1800s, early 1900s, that like you said, not high powered boats. They weren't really super, except for the 1915, they weren't really targeting them. Um, they were largely caught as bycatch and trawls. Um, and so there's kind of that period where there was low effort, weren't super targeting them, and it wasn't um, as high powered you know, fishing going on. Um, in the 1970s, though, you see a ramp up of the long line, directed long line fishery. And so we have another factor in the model that accounts for that. Um, but there's also in the South, there's been changes. They went from bandit reels and now they have different gear that they use. And that's definitely something that, um, that needs to be taken into account. It's something that we do take into account in our stock assessments. In our analysis, um, what we did was we looked simply at the number of days at sea um, as an indicator of the total effort relative to the amount of fish that they brought back to the dock. And that's what they use in the Northern stock as an index of effort, but it's not perfect. And I would love to have information in particular, the number of hooks that are set per long line, because that really tells you sometimes you could send out a mile of long line with a gazillion hooks, or you could send out a few smaller long lines with fewer hooks. Um, you could be out at sea the same number of days, but actually your fishing effort is greater if you have miles and miles of long line than if you don't. But we don't have that degree of that of specificity in the data um, for most of our reports. And so that's something that I think we would really like to get our hands on. Um, there's a group of wonderful fishermen up, uh, particularly in the, in the North. Um, and then there's a group in the South Atlantic as well and their log books um, collect that information. Uh, and it's been getting more and more reliable over the years. Uh, but for this analysis, we didn't have a long enough time series to be able to look at the, the impact on trends over time using that information. So we're hoping in the future that's something we can look at again, but great point. All right. And then the next question that we have 
Um, to, to date, have we seen changes in ocean currents, such as the Gulf Stream and the NAO, um, due, to, due to climate change or other causes? Yeah, now I'm not going to go crazy trying to answer climate because I am not a climate scientist. You'll have to get Hallie back for that. <laughs> um, but I do know that we have seen changes in ocean currents and we're anticipating great changes in ocean currents, particularly in the North Atlantic. And um, the there was a recent paper, I think too, that I saw um, saying that the ocean current that impacts the AMO the Atlantic multidecal oscillation factor that I was talking about so much um, may be breaking down. And so what happens when that does break down and the ocean current patterns change, um, either they slow, the flow may slow or speed up or the direction may change. Um, that can That's gonna have huge impacts, I believe on, on many of our fish in particular fish that are highly sensitive like golden tilefish. This is a, a good question to wrap up on, Jenny. Um, if you could make any change to the, the management of tile, tile fish, <laughs> what would you, you recommend? Oh. Wow, that's a fabulous question. It's a, and it's we're, a good we're, question. We're recording this, aren't we? So I need to be careful what I say. I'm a scientist, so... To me, I feel like we can do the best service to fishery managers and the fishermen themselves if we have better data. And so I know people don't like it, but um, I think getting very detailed logbooks from everyone who's, it's a small fishery, um, but getting that detailed information about where exactly they're fishing. The one thing I didn't show you all is that um, for some, a subset of the data, we know exactly where they were fishing. They, they keep exact records and they, their vessel is tracked, but a lot of them we don't. All we know is that they caught it in a big block somewhere between Rhode Island and Connecticut and maybe as far south as Delaware. Like some of these, they're called NIMP statistical areas. They're these big reporting areas and that's all we know. Um, if we could get more detailed location information, then we could really link it to the very detailed oceanic condition data that we've got from all the oceanographers. Um, that's when we could really answer some of these tough uh, questions about the impact of climate on our fisheries. Uh, but fishermen don't like to tell us where they fish. <laughs> At least a lot of them don't. They're growing, though. a large number of them are starting to see the value in that. And so I'm hoping we can convince more and more of them. But that's, that's the thing that I think we don't have that long time series of the location information to really match it. And I would love to see that added um, as, a, as, as something that, that was required and, and used in management. Well, that's great. By, by having more data, the scientists can develop a better, uh, better inf information to provide to managers and managers for making decisions. So that's a great recommendation, Jenny. And I want to end the seminar by thanking you so, so much for a wonderful presentation. I think um, from the questions that we've had, we've really had engaged audience this evening, and I just appreciate the time and, time and effort they put into this. Um, thank you as well to PNC and to Toyota Southern Maryland and Hyundai for their sponsorship of the series. And then we hope everyone joins us next week when we'll be hearing from Dr. Jackie Grebmeyer, who will be presenting on climate warming and the, and the chain Pacific Arctic Marine Ecosystem. We see you all back next week. Thank you and have a nice night. <laughs>